Hi, I'm Jim Zogby, <laughs> and I'm with Senator Francis Black. I'm going to lower this a bit. I'm with Senator Francis Black and, uh, and Laura Friedman, who is the head of the Foundation for Middle East Peace. Um, we're here to talk about some of the work that's been going on in Ireland. I noted when I, uh, Francis was here in the country uh, to do some work on behalf of a foundation she began that we honored her for last year here in Washington, the RISE Foundation. It's a marvelous project in Ireland that uh, focuses on the, the, what, what we're called the silent victims of alcohol and drug abuse, and that is family members and, and others who um, are often not paid attention to. Uh, while she was here in the country, I thought I couldn't but help take advantage of her presence to talk about some of the work that's going on in, 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 uh, uh, in Ireland on the issue of uh, settlement products being sold uh, in the Republic of Ireland. Um, I, I wanted to begin, if we could, with just a bit of the debate that took place in the Irish Senate, which was so, I thought, spectacular, um, and couldn't help but note as it was going on, could we ever have a discussion like this in the U.S. Senate? I doubt it, but take a listen. and. You'll see what I mean. I've seen the results of the bombing of hospitals, of schools, of uh, sewage treatment plants. It is appalling. And if you want to know what the people of Palestine, you say that you're speaking on behalf of the people of Palestine. If you want to know what the people of Palestine want, ask the Palestinian farmers. We've seen the most desperate and brutal violations of people's right to protest against injustice, against occupation, against the taking of the very ground from under people. Israel is an apartheid state. Any of us who have been there know that. Once you know that, it changes you. Though these settlements are repeatedly condemned as illegal by the EU, UN and Irish government, they continue to extract valuable natural resources and agricultural produce. These goods are then exported and sold on shelves around the world, including in Ireland, to pay for occupation. There is a clear hypocrisy here. How can we condemn the settlements as illegal, as theft of land and resources, but then happily buy the proceeds of this crime? We must be clear on this. Israeli settlements in the West Bank are war crimes. This is what we're dealing with, and I'm amazed at how relaxed people can be about it, as if trading in the proceeds of war crimes is not a big deal. I witnessed with my own eyes the crushing indignity of a Palestinian community cut off from their water supply so that it could be diverted instead to support an Israeli chicken farm. That is horrendous, and the injustice of it will stay with me forever. That commercial settlement built on stolen land beyond international recognised borders is a war crime and I know I'm repeating myself today and I'm asking my colleagues across the House today, is the moral response to simply condemn this as illegal but then ask how much for the eggs? Is there not a deep hypocrisy in that position? For a country that prides itself on upholding humanitarian principles and international law, this is unacceptable and I believe it's time we stood clearly against this injustice. We are doing commerce with people who are committing war crimes. But I believe that this bill from Senator Francis Black is where we get a chance to break the consensus that has utterly failed the Palestinian people. The case for this bill has become even more compelling, if I may say so, because we've seen appalling atrocities, uh, killing of, of Palestinian civilians. I raised 55,000 euros uh, to put in solar energy and water treatment plants, and I saw them being demolished, bombed by the Israelis. That's what happens. There is something rotten in the way democracy is defined and lived, and most importantly, denied. The relentless expansion of Israeli settlements on Palestinian territory is unjust, provocative and undermines the credibility of Israeli's commitment to a peaceful solution to a conflict to which we all want an end. Nelson Mandela came to a joint sitting of these houses in the early 1990s and he said, he said what made the practical difference uh, on behalf of the Irish people was definitive action from the people, was a boycott, was solidarity 
And that can make the difference here. The government of um, um, Benjamin uh, Net Netanyahu has to get a message. And uh, uh, through a number of phases since then, where, where does the bill stand now? So, um, firstly, let me say thanks for inviting me here today. Um, it's you know, great to be here in Washington. This is obviously something that I introduced uh, back maybe a little over a year ago, this legislation a little uh, over a year ago. Um, where we are at the moment is we have gotten it, it's gone past all stages in the Senate. But it now, and it has gone through uh, two stages in the Dáil, but it has two more stages to go through in the Dáil. And I think we're looking fairly, I mean, it's fairly positive that it's going to pass. Um, I suppose we have brought all parties apart from Fianna Gael on board. So Fianna Fáil is the main opposition party um, in Ireland and Sinn Féin, and then there's other smaller parties. It's kind of different to hear uh, as to how it all works. So uh, we were able to talk to Fianna Fáil and they have come in on board with the legislation. And their foreign affairs spokesperson is a, ma a man called Niall Collins. Um, and Niall is definitely going to be supporting this legislation and, and bringing the party with them. So we have two more stages. It has to go through um, the committee stage, um, and that goes to the Foreign Affairs Committee. And hopefully there will be a date for it going forward, maybe April or May. So, um, and I think the next two stages will happen together. And then when that's finished, so we've gotten it through, you know, we're almost there. We're almost there. And the bill specifically is not a boycott bill. Exactly. Uh, t tell us exactly what the bill does. So I just, and I think that's very <coughs> important to say that this is not BDS. And for those, you know, who, who may not know what BDS is, it's Boycott, Divestment and Sanctions. Um, and, it, you know, bo uh, BDS is, is, is a campaign I know that's happening out there where um, they're trying to stop goods coming from Israel and, and to boycott them. That's not what this is. And I really want to stress that. Um, so... At the moment, um, the uh, occupied territories where the illegal settlement, the, the settlements are being built and they are illegal under international mm -hmm. law. Um, I think there's a thousand homes now in the last few months have been built within the settlements and they're expanding and expanding and expanding. Um, and under international law, the, the International Court of Justice have said that these settlements are illegal. So what we're saying is that if they're illegal then, uh, what are the consequences? So what we're saying is, why can we not just um, ban goods that come from the illegal settlements? So it's not a huge amount coming into Ireland. It's about maybe 500,000 to a thousand, um, or sorry, to a million per year. That comes in. It's vegetables, uh, some garden furniture, um, and, and that's really all it is. So. It's, it's the symbolism of it also to say, hang on a second, there has to be consequences to these settlements that are being built. There has to be consequences. And this is what, so Ireland, uh, I, I, I would like to see Ireland leading on it. Now, you say Ireland leading on it. There's a, the EU has stipulated that the products should be labeled. Mm -hmm. But that never got acted on, did it? No, but I think there, we can do it. We can... At the moment, they are working on, on that at the moment, on, on getting the, the, any of the goods labelled um, from the occupied territories or the illegal settlements. So, um, and I think that's not going to be a problem. Already we know some of the issues like the garden furniture, like Ahava products um, that comes from the Dead Sea. Um, we went to see that factory. Uh, it's an area down by the Dead Sea in the Jordan Valley. And we saw it ourselves. And uh, Hava products are a huge cosmetic industry that comes that can come into Ireland. So that would be certainly something that we could certainly know. Here's the question: if, if, if the EU has designated the settlements illegal, mm -hmm. has said that they're going to label products, there was a concern in Ireland that you were stepping out in front of the EU. Why didn't the EU take the next logical step? 
I wish I knew the answer to that. I mean, the reality is, is that obviously the EU are afraid also. Um, and I think, I really believe that the EU are waiting for somebody to lead on this. Mm -hmm. um, and I believe Ireland can be the one that can lead on this. And already we've been in talks with other countries. We've been over to um, um, the Netherlands. Um, we've been invited out to London um, in the summer to give a talk around and to meet some parliamentarians there who are interested in this legislation. Norway are shown an interest. So already, and, and I suppose our own government are saying, um, Fina Gale are saying that it has to be, you know, we all have to do it together. But I don't think that will ever happen because we need one person to lead on it. And that's my argument always. So we're hoping that Ireland is going to be the one that leads on this and then other countries will follow. You led on apartheid. We led on apartheid. With South in, Africa. Two women, two women in, um, in a, a shop in Dublin called Dunn's Doors refused oranges. Um, uh, they wouldn't accept the oranges from South Africa. And that was the beginning of, of, of yeah. the, the sanctions in South Africa. Because I, I listened to your foreign minister, and if you listen to him speak, he sounds as if he's going to vote for it. Mm -hmm. And then he says, but because he makes all the same arguments that everybody else was making on your side. But then he says, but we can't step out in front of the EU. That's the one concern he has. Yeah. Um, and the issue of Ireland leading is intriguing here because Ireland has a unique history with Palestine, with Palestinian issues, yeah. and an affinity that goes back. And tell me about that a little bit. I mean, look, I mean, I don't know. I'd love if somebody would, would do a study on that because for some reason we um, connect very strongly um, um, with, pe with the people of Palestine. And I think there's a number of reasons. Maybe because, you know, we would have been, you know, it, from our point of view, there was a time where, you know, our land was taken from us. And, and you know, we, we understand that feeling, and, that, and, and it still impacts us to this day. You know, we still feel the pain, you know, where, where mm. people's land, particularly our, our agriculture, our farming land was taken off us. And I think it really impacts us. But there is a very strong, I mean, I myself, I really believe that this is an important piece of legislation, specifically because all we're trying to do is abide by international law. And, and that's what's really important here. It's about the international law, what's going on over there. It's illegal. And I think when I started to go around and I, I held public meetings in all over the country in Ireland um, to see what the feedback, and we had, I, I, there was one meeting where it was a room three times the size of this room um, and they were, people were turned away. So there's a huge, uh, affinity that was in Cork, but that was the same all over the country. We had packed out meetings everywhere because people um, understand. They understand that feeling of of, of land or, or farms or homes um, being taken off us, and and I think that's where we have that strong connection, and that's why there's so much support. support I follow you on Twitter, issue. and I was following you going around the country, and I was thinking. These town halls looked like somebody running in Iowa for a president. You know, I mean, you were filling you were filling city after city after city. There was a tremendous outpouring of support, and there is something in Ireland about the maybe it was the British colonial rule or uh, uh, going back. I remember in the 1920s there was a statement by one of the Irish revolutionary movements expressing solidarity for the Arab people in Palestine living under British colonial yeah. rule. It, it, uh, it seems to be quite different than the cultural experience here. Yeah. And I want to switch to, to Laura, if I could, because on the question of international law, one, but two, um, well, let, let's start, let me start with that, if I could, with the international law one, because we've been seeing these BDS bills passing all over the country, and the ones being proposed in Congress that do an interesting thing. They change the language to refer to the occupied territories as, as areas under Israel control, Israeli control. What's the impact of that, number one, domestically, but does it have a consequence in terms of the, um, 
the, the, the actual legal status. I mean, can Congress change legal status by passing laws of that sort? So, so thank you for ending on a really easy point, no. Um, and, and thank you, Senator Black, for being here and for explaining to us what is going on. I think a lot of us are following this in the news and, and you know, I know that our legislative process is pretty opaque if you're not an expert in it. Mm -hmm. And I will say that, that your legislative process is pretty opaque to me, so I, I, I appreciate this. Um, as far as the international law aspect of this, under international law, settlements are illegal. That is a full stop. There's, there's no confusion on this. You can always find one lawyer somewhere who will tell you something else. The, um, the Virtually all lawyers since 1967, whether they are in Israel or in the international community or in the United States, will say this is an occupation. And settlements, civilian settlements being built in these areas mm -hmm. under belligerent occupation, which is what Israel, technically Israeli courts call it, that is illegal. Moving your civilians there, using the resources for the benefit of the occupying country, this is all illegal. Now, I, I wrote a piece um, about a week and a half ago after the human rights report came out, the annual human rights report, and there was all of the ex excitement and angst about the lack of the word occupied. And uh, my, my piece was headlined, not breaking news, the Trump administration doesn't recognize occupation. Um, and, and it isn't just the Trump administration. I mean, if historically the United States has used the word occupied, historically the United States has worked very hard not to use the word illegal. Um, there's one instance back in the, I think, early 80s of a, uh, a State Department legal counsel who used the word illegal. Um, and I would argue, I'm not a lawyer, but I would argue that the practice of the US government long ago rendered that opinion moot. We have never treated settlements as illegal. And at this point, we are in a period of a sea change in how the US government, uh, Congress, and the administration talk about settlements. And it started, honestly, before Trump. Mm -hmm. We started having language being adopted by Congress to major trade bills that were adopted as binding law that defined Israel for the purposes of banning boycotts of Israel, or working against boycotts of Israel, I should say. It banned, is it, de it defined Israel as Israel and territories under Israel's control. That doesn't change international law, but it certainly suggests an American framing which conflates Israel and the settlements uh, into a single entity. Mm -hmm. uh, now to the second part. Uh, one of the ways that this legislation has been campaigned, the, the campaign against it, has been US Congress people speaking to their peers in Ireland, saying, if you pass this, you'll run afoul of US boycott laws, and it will threaten your ability to do business with the United States. It's two parts. One is, um, does it run afoul of U.S. boycott laws? Explain the U.S. boycott laws. Does it run afoul, and what would the consequences, if any, be if Ireland were to pass this ban on settlement products? Sure. So, first of all, I will, I will just add, I think it's a rather amazing um, intervention into the domestic politics of another country for the U.S. members of the U.S. Congress to be lobbying um, the parliament of, a, of another country. Well, we're such an um, effective democracy. It's rather, it's, it's rather extraordinary. Um, so U.S. law, uh, there's something called the U.S. Export Administration Act, which has language that dates back to the 70s, which was designed to, um, to, to, to protect Israel, let's be clear. But it was, mainly, it, was, it was really designed to protect American businesses from being turned into weapons of another country's boycott of Israel which was the Arab League boycott of Israel. The idea being the Arab League boycott is a coercive boycott. So the Arab League says, we boycott Israel, and if you want to do business with us, you, met, you must sign something saying you boycott Israel as well. Now, what's happened, what I said earlier about the conflation between Israel and settlements, there's an effort now in US policy to say, well, boycotting settlements, or even boycotting Israel as a matter of BDS, is exactly the same as the Arab League boycott of Israel. There's problems with that. One of them is that BDS, whether you support it or not, like it or don't, is not coercive. No one is saying you can't do business with X unless you sign and say you don't do business with Israel. And the second thing is, boycotting settlements is not boycotting Israel. Settlements are not Israel, even under Israeli law at this point. And that may not be true, by the way, in six months or a year. Israel seems to be on a fast track to annexing the West Bank, and this may end up being a very different conversation at that point. But as of this moment, 
boycotting settlements is not legally the same as boycotting Israel. And the language of the Export Administration Act, which I actually printed out if anyone wants to ask about it, what it bans is participating or complying with someone else's boycott of another country. It specifically talks about the boycotted country over and over. Every clause references the boycotted country. Now, let's go back to what Senator Black said earlier. Ireland is not seeking to boycott Israel. Ireland is seeking to put limits on things coming in from settlements which under even Israeli law are not Israel. So when we have members of Congress writing a letter to policymakers in Ireland saying, ah, you will run afoul of this law, it suggests to me that either they don't understand our own export law or that they are deliberately misrepresenting it. Uh, and, and, and that's a problem. Under existing law, and I should actually say, I'm not a lawyer, um, it'd be better to have an actual lawyer, but this is actually very simple, and you can look it up yourself or I'll show it to you later. The language is, is really quite simple. That isn't to say, by the way, that given the way things are going in Congress these days, that they wouldn't change the law. Mm -hmm. And if they did, they would basically, I mean, if Congress decides, based on what's happening in Ireland today, that for the purposes of US law, we are going to ban people from making decisions to not buy settlement products, irrespective of the policy on Israel, then that's a significant shift in US policy. But it's the shift that you see um, policymakers and advocates of mm -hmm. a very specific political line on Israel trying to make. It's what they're trying to do, for example, with Airbnb, which is yeah. being accused of boycotting Israel. Airbnb operates across every inch of Israel. It doesn't operate any longer in settlements. And that is being called a boycott of Israel for which they must be condemned. There are, are banks showing up on blacklists at the state. Um, banks that, for instance, I talked to one, one person who said, well, this bank is actually invested in Israel bonds, but because they're no longer doing business with, with companies working in settlements, they're being called a company that boycotts Israel despite owning Israel bonds. So we're, we're shifting to a definition of Israel where your test of whether you, whether you boycott Israel is not whether you do business in Israel, it's whether you do business in settlements. And unless you agree to do business in settlements, you are defined as a boycotter of Israel. But that is not law in the US as of this moment. And were the law that is being contemplated in Ireland to pass, it would not violate current export law. Any, any reaction to that? Yeah, I think that's really important to say, you know, and I think sometimes the people get very confused, um, you know, with what this legislation is about. And, you know, I, I have to constantly remind people that this is about international law. I can't tell you how important that is. And I also want to say, I, I believe in the two-state solution, you know, and, and, and I, you know, I think that's the right way to go, a, a peaceful, you know, way to go about this. Um, I'm also, you know, because of this legislation, I've been called anti-Semitic, and I, I find that hurtful because that's the last thing I am. I'm certainly not anti-Semitic, you know. Um, I, we have had letters from the ex-ambassadors, uh, Israeli Jewish ambassadors who live in Israel, uh, the top academics um, in Israel who have sent a letter to our government saying they support this legislation. So we have got huge support for this. Um, and, and again, we have to just keep pushing that point forward. This is about, you know, at the moment, interna international law is being violated as we sit here daily. There are settlements being built, expanded on, and something has to be done and nobody is doing anything. And it's scary, it's really, really scary. And, 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 and you know, what's happening for the people who live in the West Bank, you know, for them, I, I can't imagine what it must be like. I was there myself last year. I saw it with my own eyes and, and, and you know, I was, it was very upsetting to be honest with you. And, and the settlements are beautiful. They are stunningly beautiful. They're like, it's like a, a really fancy neighborhood maybe in Florida where there's palm trees and waterfalls and beautiful theaters and beautiful houses. And, oh, and, and you, you drive two minutes down the road and you're into, you know, refugee camps and slum areas where the water is polluted. Their electricity has been cut off, you know, um, and they might get electricity for two hours. They never know what time that electricity is going to com come on at. You know, um, we, we met with an organization over there called Breaking the Silence, you know, who are ex-Israeli soldiers. 
um, and, you know, and who told us about their experience and what it was like for them, you know, and, 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 I, and I was saying, they were telling us about, you know, how they talk about making their presence felt. And I said, what does that mean? They were saying we were told to make our presence felt where at 12 o'clock when we'd start our shift at 12 o'clock at night, we'd, we'd be on from 12 to 8, that we were go to go into the Palestinian neighborhoods and just pick any random house and go in and terrorize that family and make sure that all the other families, you know, could hear. And, and that's really the reality of the situation. And, you know, and this legislation is only one small step. It's a small step, you know, to say this is, this is wrong. And that's all it is, you know? And as I say, and I repeat myself when I say, I believe in the two-state solution, but what's going on is wrong. Let's uh, open it up if, if any questions or comments from anyone. Yes, sir? And then we'll do you. Microphone? We hope your example is, uh, is, is followed across the channel and elsewhere. Um, in this country, the politics, the domestic politics that relate to, to policy toward Israel is pretty complicated and so you don't want to oversimplify it, but, but a lot of it has to do with um, pressure brought by groups organized by religion. Um, Jewish groups, also evangelical groups. Um, what part, um, do such groups play in, in Irish politics on these issues? It's a very good question um, and something I've never really thought about. I mean, I don't think there are many, um, maybe I'm wrong and maybe I should, write, but I don't think there, there is much, um, you know, religious groups playing a part in Irish politics. I, I really don't think there are. Um, you know, I know from, my perspective and, and, and the people I, I work with in the, sh in the Senate are, you know, they all come from civil society backgrounds, you know, and social justice backgrounds. And that's where I, you know, I mean, that's where I come from. Um, but I haven't really seen that. But that's not to say, you know, it, I haven't experienced it. That's not to say it, it, it doesn't happen. I'm sure it does. Um, so I'm not sure if that kind of answers your question. Um, from, from, from my perspective. Um, so the opposition to this is not based on sort of pressure, lobby, uh, organized uh, stuff from the grassroots, but it's more the, the government concern with the EU and yeah. being out of line with that and the, the concern with whether or not this will run afoul of American boycott law. Yeah, I mean, you know, obviously I think our, you know, our government, you know, they, they, we're part of Europe, you know, and that's the way they see it and that Europe should lead on this. Um, and, and obviously there is pressure from, from the US um, and there was a letter that was sent out to um, the US, from the US Congress, some, some members of the Congress over here, who went over, who sent a letter over to Ireland to our Taoiseach and to our uh, foreign, foreign Affairs Minister. Um, and that letter was, you know, in the media. But that was only a small group of Congress uh, people. I, I, I'm not sure what the thinking was from their perspective was. Obviously, they feel under pressure. You'd know more about that than I would. Um, but the EU piece for us, and from where we're coming from, you know, or from where I'm coming from, I'm an independent uh, s senator. And I know in independent senator is different over here where you know, it's a little bit wishy-washy, whereas in Ireland you're, you're a co more courageous person to go independent, you know what I mean? You're, you're a braver person because you don't have a, you know, and I, I do that from a social justice point of view. So I, you know, and I don't, because my belief is I have very strong beliefs and I can't really go with the party line, you know, in some ways. Anyway, I'm going off the subject here. What I'm saying is the EU piece um, is very important. And I know, like, back in the 80s when the two women wouldn't receive the, the goods from South Africa and that was the beginning of something and Ireland led on that and I really believe that Ireland can lead on this and I've no doubt about that and once we get it passed 
that's the beginning. And then I believe then we can bring Europe with us. That's my belief. I'm not sure that answered your question, but yeah. It's a different system. I'm, exactly. I'm not going to tell Bernie Sanders that independent senators are wishy-washy. Sorry. Um, well, that's what I was told. I know. Or, um, or Angus King, for that matter. Yes, sir. Right here? Thank you, thank you, one, se one second. Just bring in the mic. I'm kidding. Thank you, Senator Sorry. Black. I am uh, very glad that you went over there and saw for yourself what the situation is. I just wish we have more U.S. congressmen that will do the same mm. and talk to the Palestinian people. Mm. Because as far as I know, they, they go there and only see the Israeli view. Mm. But let's go back to the uh, boycott issue. What prevents the maker of the products in the settlements from... Say, say that again, sorry. What prevents the uh, people of the settlements uh, from labeling their product as made in Israel mm -hmm. and bypass all the laws we try to implement. Well, I would imagine they would, I mean, prevent because, you know, if they do that, then everybody knows where the, the legislation comes or where the, the product comes from. You know, I mean, but I don't know. But I do know that they're you know, I know that at this, at this moment in time that that has been worked on, and I do think that that can be overcome. I mean, for example, you know, we have legislation, uh, the Public Health Alcohol Bill, um, that's going to be, you know, has been signed into law, and we're having, you know, we're going, there's going to be labels on those, and I have no doubt that, you know, the customs can can see it, and I think it can be done the same way, you know, that once we know where that product comes from, I've no doubt that the customs will be able to sort it and say, look, we refuse. Laura, the, the U.S. has its own labeling requirement. You want to talk about that a little bit? Sure. Uh, Which is things. ironic, yeah, I think, in a way. Two things. I mean, the labeling issue is has been one that people have worked on for many years. The U.S. has labeling requirements. Um, over recent, um, the past few years, I think there's, there's been challenges on whether they are being properly implemented. Um, and Israel has more or less said, fine, we'll label, um, we'll do it. Uh, the point I think here, th there's two issues. One, as Senator Black said earlier, the volume of goods coming from settlements, I mean, if, if there are laws banning the entry of settlement products, that is not going to make or break the settlement enterprise. This is about, um, when people talk about settlement boycott, whether you're talking about the Israeli left or, or foreign countries, what they're talking about is sending a strong message, which is the, our, our, our support for Israel stops at the green line. The legitimacy of Israeli goods coming to us stops at the green line. And, it, and it's a powerful symbolic statement. And it's a powerful symbolic statement coming at a time when we are almost 52 years into occupation, and the Israeli policy increasingly over recent years is walking away from any political horizon to ending that occupation, and in fact is going the other direction to saying, if you support Israel, you have to endorse settlements. If you support Israel, it means you have to recognize permanent control over the West Bank in perpetuity. Mm -hmm. and, and, and these sort of, the reason, I mean, we joke about this sometimes. Um, when, when I was years ago with another organization that was endorsing settlement boycott, and the immediate response of the world was, well, you shouldn't do this, uh, you, it's, boycotts are bad in general. And the Trump, Trump card they always pulled out was, and it won't make any difference at all. So it's a, stupid, it's a stupid thing to call for. And my answer then is the same as my answer now. It's about the symbolism, not about the economics, first and foremost. And if it's not going to make any difference at all, I submit to you, why is it that the Israeli government has legislated against it? It's so, it's so non-threatening that Israel has adopted an entire body of law preventing and criminalizing settlement boycott. And here, people who think that they want to stand shoulder to shoulder with the most right-wing forces in the Israeli government are trying to change US law to criminalize it as well. So even if it's strictly just the symbolic part of it, it's highly significant. And it's seen as highly threatening. Um, and that's why you're getting this pushback against legislation which is not in any way, shape, or form about boycotting yeah. Israel. And we had, by the way, a similar, very, I would say, overreaction 
to the EU back three, four years ago now, just adopting a policy which said we differentiate, people should differentiate between Israel and the settlements. And they adopted that statement in the context of a very long statement reiterating all of the EU's support for Israel. This was one piece in a very long statement of support for Israel. Mm -hmm. So even the symbolic idea of saying this is Israel, this is not, in this moment, as we are, again, 52 years of occupation almost, and we're moving towards outright annexation. I mean, just as an observation, the fact that we're talking about measures against settlements now that are stronger, it's not a coincidence that this is happening now when the peace process has been effectively over for a decade. For a very long time, if someone talked about settlement boycott or pressure on settlements, the answer was, don't, don't go there right now, we're making peace. Mm. We're, we're making progress, this will be wrapped up in the peace process, don't do things that'll make this harder. All of the energy to actually start differentiating, putting real pressure on settlements, didn't start until the peace process, for all intents and purposes, ended. Mm -hmm. So, you, ma'am, and then you and you. And then you. Thank you very much. Um, you mentioned that, of course, what happens to everyone that speaks about justice in, in Palestine and for Palestinians are immediately called anti-Semitic. Um, there's a very troubling phenomenon, and I'm wondering to what degree it might also be occurring in Ireland, because it's going on internationally, and especially in the United States. Yeah. I've written an article about it, in which the, ch the definition of anti-Semitism, instead of being the bigotry that we all abhor, uh, contains making certain types of statements about Israel. This new definition was actually first formulated by an Israeli minister and then was adopted by uh, an individual in the U.S. State Department. It's being adopted and pushed in various entities in Europe and even other parts of the world, some of which are now adopting it. Is that also occurring in, in Ireland? Has it been uh, promoted or, or introduced yet? Or is it going to be adopted? Or anything that you know would be very helpful. You mean with regard to, say, being labeled anti-Semitic? Yeah, um, yeah, I mean, look, I've been under fierce pressure, seriously, fierce pressure uh, in Ireland um, um, from the lobbyists, I suppose, the pro-Israel lobbyists, and, um, but it's not as intense as it would be, say, in, as in Britain, in, in, in the UK. Um, but there's no doubt about it, um, you know, and we had, you saw on that video, Michael McDool is a, um, he spoke um, um, in support of the legislation. He's an ex-attorney general uh, in Ireland. And, um, you know, he wrote an article, you know, saying, you know, because I support this legislation, just I'm not, I'm not anti-Semitic and I find that, you know, offensive. Um, so there's no doubt about it that pressure has been uh, put on us. I mean, I, like I've got unbelievable threats, you know, online threats and stuff like that. Um, because of, of this legislation. But, you know, I know in my heart that this is the right thing, you know, this is the right thing to do, and, and that's all I can do. And I know also I'm not anti-Semitic, you know, and I know that in my heart, do you know? So I can be called all the names I like, and I can be, you know, abused all as much as possible. I know that this is the right thing to do. But I don't think it's, it's as bad in Ireland as it would be in the UK and, in, and here in the US, for sure. Just to add, yeah. I think you're talking about the, the language, the international language that there is pressure to adopt in the U.S. We have legislation that will possibly move this week in the U.S. Senate in the form of the Anti-Semitism anti Awareness Act. Um, and, and I don't know about Ireland. There's unquestionably a campaign right now on capitals across the EU to have a formal definition of anti-Semitism adopted as law. And this definition of anti-Semitism is clearly written to quash free speech on Israel. And the gentleman who actually initially who drafted the, the, the definition, a guy named Kenneth Stern, who wrote it when he was with the American Jewish Committee, and it was a definition that was written to help understand how anti-Semitism grows and moves and to, 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 to monitor it. It was never written to be legislated, and he has written, this mm -hmm. gentleman, multiple op-eds in the United States, uh, the, the major papers, the New York Times, the LA Times, and he's written letters to members of Congress really beseeching people not to put this into law. 
because it will represent a limitation on free speech. It's almost unquestionably unconstitutional. And his argument is that it will actually cause anti-Semitism, um, especially when we're talking about on campuses. But this is, this is unquestionably happening across the capitals in Europe. And once this is ad adopted as a formal definition of anti-Semitism, you know, things like an effort to, to clamp down on settlements, it's very easy to say, well, you may not think you're anti-Semitic, but because you are zeroing in on Israel, by definition, it's anti-Semitism. If you're not talking about every country that does bad things in the world in every piece of legislation, if you talk about Israel, you're an anti-Semite. Um, and that, that, that's really very problematic. And I would argue, as someone who cares about Israel, it doesn't help Israel mm -hmm. at all. Um, Let's I have a take question. a couple together. We'll take you, you, and then you. Right. Uh, welcome to America, uh, Senator Black. You gave a wonderful presentation, as did you too, uh, uh, Lauren. Uh, my question for Senator Black has to do with public uh, poll, polling numbers, such recent ones, such as you might be aware of, um, of the Irish population, on a range of issues on uh, both the nature of Israel, uh, the nature of the Palestinian struggle, solutions, one state versus two state. You know, I, I, I want to get a feel for the, the average Irish man and woman in the street. How do they feel about the entire issue? Looked at from all sides. And questions of anti-Semitism. You know, I'm, I'm by definition an anti-Semite because I'm a Palestinian Holocaust victim who said, said I want a democratic secular Palestine. I want to go back to my home in Sheikh Moana's village. I'm, I have horns, you know. Mm -hmm. But how does the Irish... How do the Irish people feel today about Thank that, based on poll numbers? Back to you. Thanks for coming. Thanks for having this event. Uh, last year, I was in Palestine around this time uh, with an organization called Rebuilding Alliance. And we traveled around and looked at Khan al-Amar, uh, Susia, the Jordan Valley, places that are under threat of being demolished, villages and communities. And in fact, uh, in the run-up to the elections, they're saying that there's even more a threat of these uh, villages being targeted. And my question is, um, you're, you're saying that maybe this legislation is symbolic, but I was wondering if you could speak to the larger EU complicity uh, with the occupation, uh, the, the arms trade, the economic, the broader economic relations. It's not only that people are not doing anything about the occupation, they're making it stronger. I think that's more the case and, mm -hmm. and strengthening the occupation and more ingraining it and uh, mm -hmm. facilitating human rights violations. Mm -hmm. And then back here. And then we'll, so we have public opinion, EU. Thank yeah. you, Senator, for supporting the Palestinian. I'm a Palestinian. I have a house uh, at Ramallah. Uh, but my question, if uh, this passage of the bill would put Ireland on breach uh, of the EU law, and it would open it up to legal action from the EU, including monetary fines, and it could cost Ireland millions of euros. How are you guys going to handle it? <laughs> Thanks. First, the public opinion. Public opinion in Ireland, um, no doubt about it, um, huge support um, for the Palestinian people uh, in Ireland. I mean, and you know, you know, you know, and, and, and Jim asked me, like, why do I think that is? And I, I genuinely don't know. I really, you know, I mean, we can say that we can identify with the whole, you know, the colonialism and all of that kind of stuff. But um, I don't know. It's something, there's something really that pulls us towards this issue that we just feel is, 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 is unjust, you know. Um, and, you know, I think the majority of people in Ireland you know, would definitely support this legislation anyway. There's no doubt about that. Um, so, but I do think it would be great if somebody could do a piece of, uh, you know, research on it as to why, why that's all happening. I mean, even our own minister stood up that, you know, day in the Shannad and was so empathetic to, to you know, the Palestinian situation um, and so empathetic, you know, and, 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 and has done in fairness to him, has sent over a lot of aid to Gaza, you know, and, and has compassion, you know, uh, but he does feel under pressure from EU. Um, yeah, I mean, when I listen to his speech, opposing the legislation, uh, for the first nine-tenths of the speech, I thought, oh my God, he's supporting this. Mm. I mean, he was, I, there is nobody in our Senate, including Bernie Sanders, who's very pro-Palestinian, mm 
who gave a speech as supportive as the, prime, the, as the foreign minister of Ireland did. Then at the last minute he said, but I can't support it because the EU. That was the, that was the sole argument. Um, and, um, yeah. and so, yeah, and I, I, just, I, mean, I just might know I, somebody who could do a poll. Can I give you another example of that? Um, you might know, oh yeah, poll, yeah. I'll give you another example of that. I mean, Fine Gael, who are our government, right? And in the, in the, in the Senate that day, um, a few of them came up to me. This is, so this is the party who were against this legislation and said that they asked for a free vote um, because there was so much support within their own party for it. And when one man who I know very well, who had been to Palestine, he was a Fine Gael senator, and when he pressed the no vote, he sobbed because it broke his heart that he had to go against his beliefs. So I suppose they're just examples of the support. It, you know, lots of Fine Gaelers come up to me and go, well done, Francis, on this legislation. So even, you know, the government party, the members of the government party are supportive of this mm -hmm. legislation. I'm, I'm not going to, I do want to get to the EU question first. Um, so the, the EU, EU complicity on the one hand, the, the role that they play negative or whatever, and the, and the issue of um, the penalties that might incur, mm. Ireland might incur yeah. uh, if it were to pass it. I, I, are there actual penalties? I don't think there are penalties, but I will have to double check that to, and I will get back to you on it because this is where my uh, legal genius that works with me in the office would have all the answers to that. I know that's the line that the government are using at this point, um, but I don't think that it's possible, I if I remember rightly, that they can do that, you know, but legally. But I will have to get back to you on that to, be, to give you a proper, precise answer to it. I don't believe that they can, and I don't think, if I believed that they could, I wouldn't be, you know, fighting it to the death, and I do think, and trying to get it through. I don't think they have a leg to stand on. We have spoken to many different lawyers. Um, we have many different legal opinions who say they can't. So, and I think even our ex attorney general, uh, who we spoke to, who you saw on that, also says they can't. So, but I will have to come back to you with more detail. I okay. hope that makes sense. Brian? they made the ruling that was against the EU law, then Ireland could amend that legislation so that they wouldn't be liable for any fines mm -hmm. and things like that. Okay. But uh, we have got um, uh, legal advice that this does not yeah. go against uh, EU law. Yeah. Okay. I hope that helps, but we will come back to you with more detail on that. Yeah. Sorry? No, we won't get hurt. Trust me. Trust me, right, we won't. Right here, yes. And then I think this is the last one. Yes. Uh, um, I apologize for my poor English and my French accent. Uh, I would like to know if, uh, if the uh, products from the Golan Heights and the uh, Sheba Farm, Lebanese Sheba Farm, are the, uh, I mean, this, this new law will, will, will include those, those, those products or not? Um, my, my first question. No, no. Brian, maybe you would like to come in there again? If they are in legal precedent, then... Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm talking about uh, if they're in legal precedent and, and occupy land under international Yeah, I mean, it, 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 you know, it's Ill illegal settlements that where the uh, International Court of Justice have said, you know, this under international law. So if... And so it's any illegal settlements under that that, inter, that the Irish the International Court of Justice have said, you know, is is is, is being violated. Mm -hmm. So if that's the goal in Heights, then yes, I think Western Sahara there's a possibility, but not we're not sure of yet. So so it's all occupied here. Um, I, I believe it's a good start. It's a good point uh, uh, to push forward the. the that uh, we, we should sanction, uh, the, the international community should sanction because mm -hmm. there is no BDS 
if, if, there is, if there are sanctions. We, we implement <laughs> the BDS because the International Committee don't do his, his job. Mm. This is why mm. we, we as civil society, we, we respect the picket line of, mm -hmm. of, mm -hmm. of the Palestinian people. And uh, I would like to know how, how it will be articulated technically if, the, if, if it's, uh, if it's uh, about the production site or the, where the, the headquarters of the company who's exploiting those, those stolen land. I mean, it's important to know how, how they will move this and, and trick uh, to, to avoid. They, they already do that. They're already mm -hmm. trying to avoid mm. the labeling, mm, expressly labeling as, as mm -hmm. uh, Golan Heights or, or this or that. So maybe Thank you. Yeah. Listen, I, I want to turn to a less controversial, more complicated topic, a less complicated Brexit. I can't, I can't, no, I can't let you go without hearing where, oh. I, we, my, we were in Ireland last year, and we were up in Donegal, which is in the way northwest corner, and we were driving back to Dublin using GPS, and all of a sudden there were UK flags, and I was like, what the hell, you know, and because there's no border, and the level of economic integration and public integration of people on both sides is really significant. And now all of a sudden comes Brexit, which is the focus, a lot of it is on the UK, but mm. it's a huge issue in, in, uh, in the Irish Republic. And, and you've got uh, the North being part of the problem in supporting the, yeah. the, 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 the government, the Tory government. Yeah. But, how is it being perceived in, um, in the Republic itself? Well, and what are the fears or concerns about this? Um, it's very worrying, as you can imagine. Um, there's so many different pieces of it. Obviously, trade is going to be a huge thing. Um, I know, for example, uh, particularly businesses in the north. Um, and we've had meetings, we've been on, you know, um, we've had committee meetings where big business has, have come down and presented to us. I, I suppose in a way they feel a little bit abandoned because you know, nobody has kind of taken ownership of, of the reality of the situation, if you know what I mean. So there's a couple of things, obviously. Ag agriculture is, is a huge because you know, what happens, say, with beef farming you know, or dairy produce, say, for example, where you'd have a big farm in, in the six counties in the northern part um, and they would send their, their milk down to the southern part, which is like probably only two miles or ten or five miles, and then they would pasteurize it there and then it would go back into the north. Now, if there's a, a Brexit situation and there's a hard border, that could, that's a serious catastrophe. But the other part of it is, is that um, at the moment, the farmers in the north would be getting a huge amount of funding from the EU also. So that's one issue. The Good Friday Agreement for me is probably the most important piece of it. And the Good Friday Agreement for those, or some people call it the Brexit um, Agreement, or the Belfast uh, Agreement, was when you know, peace came to, we had George Mitchell uh, over from, from here, an amazing man, came over, he negotiated, was part of the negotiations of the Good Friday Agreement you know, to stop the conflict in the North between the two sides. And that agreement, to me, is probably one of the best pieces of, 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 of a, well, the best agreement, I, I think, from, our, from Ireland's point of view that ever existed. And that is under serious threat now with Brexit negotiations. And I think uh, particularly for um, people who consider themselves Irish citizens in the North, um, they're very, very concerned that their basic human rights are going to be taken away from them, um, particularly around the Irish language, um, around gay marriage, um, and stuff like that, and already that's starting to, you know, fall apart. But look, we don't know what's going to happen. There's talk that Theresa May is going to resign um, over the next few days. We don't know what's going to happen if that happens. Um, um, I think where we're at at the moment is that there has been, you know, like, a, a delay. You know, they've asked for a little bit more time. They've gotten that little bit more time. 
But if they can't make a decision by, I think there's some date in April, if they can't make a decision, then it's going to be a hard Brexit. Now, there's another side to a hard Brexit uh, for, for Ireland, um, and which is kind of a little bit, could be, um, hasn't been spoken about that much because everybody, I suppose, particularly from the Irish government's point of view, they don't want to upset uh, the unionists uh, in the north. But if there is um, a hard Brexit and, you know, there could possibly be talk then of a border poll, which means that if there is a border poll, um, there could be talk of what we would now, instead of saying maybe United Ireland, but a new Ireland, um, where, you know, the north and the south are united again. So that's kind of it in a synopsis as much as I can possibly give you. It's a complete and utter disaster. A much disaster. simpler issue than, than... Yeah, it's than, a disaster. It's yeah. a complete and utter disaster. And I don't, I, it's beyond me. Uh, I really don't think that uh, the people, um, and, and, and I could be wrong here, but I really don't think they know what, they're, they know what they've gotten themselves into. Yeah. I don't think they realize the impact um, on themselves, really, and, and particularly on trade. And, and the money that's going to be. Everything that we hear about the impact on trade, both in terms of the North, but also mm -hmm. in terms of the South and your exports to, to the, UK the UK itself, and the UK itself mm -hmm. literally being stranded. Yes. Trump promising them a great deal. Um, he seems to promote great deals, but none of that fulfills the or, or in any way compensates for the current situation that... No, and I mean, look, tra trade deals could take anything from six to eight to ten years. Yeah. You know, so what happens in the meantime? That's what it takes to build, you know, so... Um, and I can't imagine Trump giving them a good deal. I really don't think mm -hmm. that, you know, he would be that way inclined, so... Well, thank you so much, uh, Francis Black, for joining us, and thanks all of you for coming. Um, if you have a question for Francis... The, Finish. I know we promised you an answer. Email me at jzogby. At, okay, just do that, and I will get the answer from Francis, and we'll get back to you. In but more thank detail. You. But thank you all very much.